it is, was so appropriate last week as Phil brought to us out of Acts chapter 1 at the end of that chapter talking about how the 11 apostles, after Judas had left them, they came together and they came in and by the power of the Spirit, they brought in Matthias to join them to build back up the ranks of the 12 apostles. And that's where we are at this morning uh, as we enter into Acts chapter 2, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is a day that all through the Old Testament, the prophets have longed to see and Jesus has been promising to his disciples as he walked among them, and especially in those last 40, 50 days he was with them, uh, beginning in John chapter 14, just prior to Gethsemane, and then in his next period that he had with them as the risen Christ, he just told them over and over and over again, just wait, just wait till the Holy Spirit comes. Then I'm going to send you. You will have power from on high. He will anoint you, he will fill you, and he will equip you for the work that I have commissioned you to do. So for about the past 40 or 50 days, as we come to Acts 2, the disciples have been with the risen Christ. And as we've already learned, he's been instructing them, proclaiming to them, equipping them, and getting them ready for the big task ahead. And in Acts 1, verses 4 through 8, Jesus said this to them, Do not depart from Jerusalem... But wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, this is a whole new occurrence. So you can imagine what they are anticipating. What are their expectations? Is a is the Spirit going to descend sometime in like a form like a dove that he did to Jesus at his baptism? Well, how are they going to know that the Spirit actually arrived? He then further told them in verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, what was that going to be like? They were well aware that they hadn't scored very well on the pre-exam 50 days earlier when they all fled Jesus at Gethsemane. So they fully understand that they were desperately needing a work of power in their life. Something needed to change and transform them if they were going to actually be able to be sent out by Christ and be an effective witness. Oh, it was easy and strong for them when they were around the risen Christ. But what were they going to do when he was gone? He said in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Surely the coming of the Holy Spirit was going to connect the dots for the assurance of God's presence dwelling in them. They needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we do too. You see, although we're 2,000 years removed from this scene here at Pentecost, we are not removed from the experience and the effect that we all have through the Holy Spirit today. You have been grafted into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5, 18. So we need the work of the Spirit in our lives And the commission that Jesus gave the disciples is still our mission today. Nothing's changed. We are still called to be his witnesses. And so if the disciples needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? 2,000 years removed. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And already I can see the wheels turning in your head because this is such an issue that has divided the church. There's much confusing using uh, scriptural terminology perhaps in the wrong way or an emphasis in, in one way than in another in different backgrounds that we've had. And rather than a unifying work of the Spirit, what we see perhaps across the landscape in Christianity today is actually div- division, distrust, fear, wondering, finger pointing. And that is not at all why the Holy Spirit has come. 
The Holy Spirit has come to baptize us into one spirit, one Lord, one baptism. And so more than anything this morning, I'm praying that the Father would give us, by His Spirit, clarity about His Word. And so I would ask you just for a moment just to set aside everything that you've heard and somehow, I know it's not possible, but just to allow the text of the Word of God to speak directly to our hearts this morning. So let's dig in. Acts chapter 2. We're going to cover verses 1 through 13 this morning, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed. They were astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that they we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrosia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking, jesting, saying, they're filled with new wine. As we come this morning, I hope none of us have that last sentence. <laughs> jesting, joking, laughing it off. So I pray that the Spirit would bring us to a place this morning to hear what he has to say. Let's pray. Father God, we're just so thankful for your word and just ask that you would speak, uh, speak with clarity, that you would bless us and fill us now as you give authority to your word and open up our hearts and our minds to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at this in three brief ways. First, we're going to take verse 1. And we're going to talk about God's plan fulfilled. Then we're going to look at verses 2 through 4 and talk about God's presence as it came in the Holy Spirit was assured. They knew that he had come. And then in verses 5 through 13, we're going to talk about the effects of the Holy Spirit and how God's purpose was revealed when the Spirit came. So first, the coming of the Holy Spirit is God's plan fulfilled. It says there in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived. Luke is helping us to anticipate, and the New American Standard translation says this, when the promised day of Pentecost was being fulfilled. In other words, he's saying, hey, anticipate something. On this day of Pentecost, something is going to happen. The promised one is coming. So they're all together. There's still the 120 they're all gathered in a house, most likely somewhere in a house close to the temple grounds. It's Pentecost. That means it's late April, early May, somewhere in that standpoint. It's great weather outside. There's a ton of people in Jerusalem. Leviticus 23 lays out three great agricultural celebrations and festivals and feasts where the people came together in Jerusalem and came to celebrate what God had done for them. And Pentecost was the one of the best weather of the whole time. So this place was packed with people, more even than the Passover 50 days earlier. There were people everywhere. And unlike Passover, it wasn't a celebration of leavened bread this time, of unleavened bread. It was leavened bread. And every worshiper brought in two loaves of fresh baked bread. And on Pentecost, Jerusalem became the biggest bakery in the world. It must have been incredible. So Sparrow Bakery fans out there, yeah, it would have been good. So here we are, and Leviticus 23, if we turn to that, 
it gives us these different feasts. And what's amazing is that they correlate exactly with God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ in the events that took place in Jesus for the work of our salvation. So first we come, if you look there, well, don't turn there, it'll take too long. Leviticus 23 begins at verse 15. He goes through these three feasts there in Leviticus. They're called the High Holy Days. And the significant events are this. First is Passover. And we know that relates to Christ because Christ has become our Passover lamb. And while they were doing the Passover, it was the same time that our Lord Jesus was, gave himself as a sacrifice for us on the cross. Then there was the first offering during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was that time that immediately followed the Passover. It began on the day after the Sabbath, which would have been a Sunday. And that's where the first barley sheaf of grain was brought in and waved before the priests. And it was thankful for the provision of God. And it was presented back as a first fruits. And that correlated exactly to Jesus Christ's resurrection where he is our first fruit. And Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus, again, is shown in that first fruits offering that he is our resurrection. And then we come to the Feast of Pentecost, which is where we're at today. It's 50 days after. It's also called the Week of Weeks. So it's been Seven periods of seven weeks plus one day after the Sabbath of Passover. And what it was was the culmination of both the barley and the wheat harvest where everything was gathered in, and it is just a celebration of the great new things that God has done by his provision. It was a new harvest of a new time, and they were celebrating how good God had been to them. Now that day of Pentecost would forever be linked again to Jesus Christ as he ascended and gave the Holy Spirit. It was a new era of blessing poured out on all believers, and the age of the church was born. So Jesus himself even connected his ascension with the coming of the Spirit. He says in John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the Helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. So as Christ ascended, he put in motion the plan to send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's coming has been part of God's plan all along. We read in uh, Ezekiel 36, and I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. So Jesus, in his promises to the disciples, is just bringing forward the Old Testament promises that God had planned all along. The Holy Spirit coming is the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation, where we are completely reborn by the power of the Spirit and made into a new creation. This is the gift and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You remember Jesus' words to Nicodemus back in John 3. Nicodemus, a religious leader, he was stunned when Jesus said to him, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He was shocked. And what Jesus went later on to say is that you must be born of the Spirit it's the Spirit who gives life, Jesus said in John 7, for the flesh is no help at all. In other words, there's nothing that we can bring. There's no religious activity. There's no checking the box that will ever transform us from the inside out and make us a righteous people that is acceptable to a holy God. That is totally the indwelling, powerful work of the Holy Spirit as he brings the gospel to bear in our hearts brings us to repentance, brings us to confession and say, oh Lord, I am lost. I need you. Come, save me. We must be born again. 
You know, how many times have we said to ourselves over the course of our life, I can't believe that just came out of my mouth. As we think about things that we've said to our spouse, to our children, to our friends, either in anger or something about a lustful joke or an innuendo or something totally inappropriate, totally ungodly, and we're taken back and shocked. And we know how hard it is to control our tongue. Why? Because that is the evidence of what is inside our heart. Now, the tongue is one thing to control. Imagine a whole life that we are to live in righteousness before a holy God. If we are unable even to change ourselves as far as what we speak, how much more our whole life and how we live? Oh, we need the Holy Spirit. We need him to transform us and change us and grip us and take hold of us and make a change in us. We don't have it within us to change ourselves. This is the work of God's Holy Spirit. This is his plan being fulfilled. So when Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down, we know that it is God's plan being fulfilled. So the, Holy, the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was not hastened in. It was not brought about by the 120 gathered in the room. It's not because they had been together for 10 days praying. It has nothing to do with that because it's a part and portion, portion of the plan of salvation of God for us. And it is no more repeatable the day of Pentecost, then it would be to say Jesus needs to be reborn, he needs to be re-crucified, he needs to be re-resurrected, all of those things need to take place. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost is a one-time event because it's part of the plan of salvation that grafts us into the body of Christ and fills us and equips us with the power that we need to live a life for God. And so, Part of the confusion of, is due to terminologies that we don't use correctly in the modern era. So some would say, oh, I long for the day of Pentecost again. Well, no. Would you long for Christ to be crucified again? No. And so there's some terminology that is just helpful for us to get straight this morning. So I'm hoping that we get some clarity here on those things for our hearts to help alleviate and flatten out some of that confusion. So the Holy Spirit has come in the fulfillment of God's plan. And when the Holy Spirit came, He came with a powerful sign and presence to let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was unmistakable that He was there. And that's our second point as we go on, verses 3 to 4, that the coming of the Holy Spirit is God's presence assured. Now, it makes sense that when the Holy Spirit came for this first time, that it is a big thing that is unmistakable, because no one had ever had this experience before. They had to know that the Lord's words were true, that the promised one has come. They needed to know that they were equipped and empowered to do His mission. So they absolutely needed to be sure that he was present with them. And so the Holy Spirit comes in verses 2 through 4 with three signs that were unmistakable and could not be missed. And these were all very familiar traits and nuances to these Jewish believers who were brought up in the Old Testament. The first one was wind, Acts 2, 2. And suddenly they came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So first, it came from heaven, showing that it originated from God. Second, it was a sound like a tornado. Their, their robes weren't being blown off. The house wasn't in disarray. Things just weren't flying in the air. There was a sound like a tornado that started up above in the heavens and rushed into the house. It must have been a cacophony of sound because it was so loud that it says later in verse 6 that the whole crowd gathers because of the noise. It must have been immense. 
Linguistically in the Greek, the word for both wind and spirit is pneuma. They're exactly the same word. And Jesus used them interchangeably even when he was talking to Nicodemus in John 3. He says this, the wind pneuma blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit, pneuma. So to the disciples, to the 120 that were gathered, with this wind coming, it was a direct correlation that this is the presence of God. The next sign we see is fire, Acts 2, 3. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, these weren't flames, right? They're not losing their hair. But something is supernatural that could only be described as looking as some tongue of fire. A literal translation is this, and as tongues of fire appeared to them, it distributed among them and then rested on each one of them. So perhaps something like a bright light, like a fire came into the room, it disseminated and it went out and it was on every single one of those gathered. All 120 had the tongue like fire on their heads resting. And this is an exact a connection to them for the presence of God that is displayed through the whole period of Exodus about God's presence to the children of Israel, the burning bush with Moses, the Sinai fire flashing on the mountaintop as the law was given, or the pillar of fire by night that led them through the wilderness. It was a constant picture that God was with them. And now as the fiery like tongues came upon them, it could not be missed. Fire in the Old Testament oftentimes is often a reflection of judgment, too. And that's like, whoa, what's going on here? But I want you to notice Jesus' words in Acts 1.5. If your Bible's open, look at that carefully. He said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back and look up the reference where, John's refer, where Jesus is referring to about John the Baptist's words, he's taking us back to Matthew 3.11. And there, what John the Baptist actually says is you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus drops that off when he's giving this uh, scripture to his disciples. Why? Because he is emphasizing to them that this Holy Spirit that is coming to them, the believers, is all a total blessing. It's something that is going to fill them, equip them, and help them in their walk of godliness. Just like uh, Romans says to us, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no judgment coming to us because the Holy Spirit has come to rest upon them. No, the Holy Spirit is good. He is not something to be feared. The Holy Spirit is wonderful, and we should embrace Him and not turn away from His work that He wants to do in our lives. The presence of the Holy Spirit was like fiery tongues, and it rested on each one of them. Again, this is a symbolism of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to them so that they knew that they were grafted together as one body under one Lord, under one church. And so this baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for those 12 apostles. It's for us today. And if you are saved by the power of Christ, you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to you, sealed in you as a guarantee of the promise to come of your residence in heaven with the Lord. And so you have the Holy Spirit resident, dwelling inside you right now, this moment, if you love Jesus Christ. The promise had come. His presence was assured. And the Holy Spirit was with them. Then the presence of this, of the Holy Spirit with them was reinforced even farther as this third sign appeared. It says in verse uh, 4 there, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
just like the appearance of fire rested on each one of them, it says all of them were filled. Now, the word here for other tongues means glossa, glossalia, where we use that word, and it just means either the organ actually of your tongue or a language. And they all began to speak in other languages, other dialects, other known languages that were not their native tongues. And we can be sure that's the case because it says that exactly in verses 6 through 11, that the crowd gathered and they were astonished, it says in verse 6 and 7, because they're hearing their own foreign languages spoken by these Galileans. And they're perplexed, they're amazed, they're astonished. They're going, what is going on? They are hearing their own language. So this supernatural gift and ability immediately assures them of the presence of the Holy Spirit because they are given words that express the glory and the grandeur and the mighty power of God. Just like in the Old Testament, just what happened to the prophets of old when God sent his Holy Spirit on those individuals, so it was happening to them. And when they were exclaiming the mighty works of God, it says in verse 11. So Moses, Samuel, Isaiah, Joel, Jeremiah, they all began to prophesy when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Inspired words given from God for his people. Remember the story of even King Saul, who was really no prophet at all, when he encountered the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit made him just lay down in the dust and just prophesy and declare about the mighty works of God. The Word of God is what signifies God's presence. And the Word of God is exactly what these 120 were speaking at Pentecost. Like I said in verse 11, if you look down there, it says, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And next week, we'll get into Peter's sermon, and he references back to Joel chapter 3. And Peter also brings forward and is explaining to the crowd that that's exactly what's happening. The words that they're hearing them speak is that they are prophesying in accordance with Joel 3. I will pour out my spirit and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now, prophecy here for us is probably best understood to make known the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit about the saving acts of God through Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Peter and the apostles were doing that day. And that's exactly what these 120 were overwhelmed with as the Holy Spirit came and filled them. They declared the mighty power of God with their word that the Holy Spirit had gifted them with. These weren't gifted men. They were guys like us. They didn't know the Bible inside and out, but they knew enough where the Spirit could take that and empower them and speak the glory of God through them. Oh, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, just like they did. The point is here, is that whenever you see the Holy Spirit moving in acts, whenever you see the word filled, whenever you see him moving in power, it is always associate with a boldness to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you see anything, hear anything, are sidetracked by anything that takes the Holy Spirit to an individual experience that gets you away from the Word of God, run as fast as you can. Because the Holy Spirit always comes to declare and honor and exalt Jesus Christ and glorify God. If anything becomes self-focused, self-motivated, self-exalting, it's not from the Spirit. We can be sure of that. So this is one good thing that Acts shows us here in our very confusing world. So the Holy Holy Spirit's presence with them was unmistakable. Wind, fire, tongues. It all assured them that God had did what He promised. The Holy Spirit had come. The promised one was there. And they now could do what God had called them to do. I want to take a couple moments, since I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, and uh, which is strange for me, but uh, hopefully this is uh, profitable for us. 
Before we go on to our next thing, I just want to stop here in verses 2 through 4 and just talk about all the questions that come into our minds as we enter in and start talking about being filled with the Spirit, baptism with the Spirit, Pentecost, what's going on? So I just want to lay out for you what our understanding and what we basically hold fundamentally true between the leadership here at Grace. And there is allowance here for grace with one another. There is allowance here for maturity and growth for all of us as we grow in understanding and wisdom. And so none of this is to be anything that you should feel divisive about, but rather the whole goal is to draw us in unity under the power of the Lord. So first, just if you have questions like me, it's like, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how does it differ being filled with the Spirit? Well, as we already said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Everyone who comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ is sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit for our future guarantee of redemption, and we are immediately baptized into one body, just as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So all of us who are believers have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in Scripture does it command us or tell us to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So many of us, that terminology is flying around. That's not biblical. That's just a wrong use of terminology. It doesn't mean that we don't desire the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. As it says in Ephesians 5.18, we're to be filled continuously with the Holy Spirit. But there's just a difference in terminology that would be helpful if we got that straight. So, for that. Also, just what does being filled with the Holy Spirit do? Does it mean that all of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit should all speak in tongues? Is that, what, is that what's happening? And there's, even in the book of Acts, that's not the case. There are many instances where the Word says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and what, is, uh, what comes forth from that is the proclamation of the gospel. Even in the 3,000 who come to accept Christ and come to saving faith at the end of chapter 2 after Peter's sermon, there is no mention there that they have received the gift of tongues. No, they are saved and grafted and baptized by the Holy Spirit into the kingdom. But there's no mention there of tongues. In the book of Acts, tongues is always a known language. It's always a language that grafts in a significant historical event that is moving forward God's plan of salvation. And there's four times in the book of Acts where it's either directly said or perfectly implied that that's exactly what happened, that the gift of tongues had come. And each time it's recorded is to show that this new group of people were being brought into the kingdom of God under one spirit, under one Lord. It happens here with these Jews. And it's all in accordance with what Jesus said in Acts 1.8, where he says, you will be my witness is in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, four distinct groups, four, di four distinct historical patterns where they spoke in tongues to signify that exactly what Jesus said had occurred. The kingdom of God was expanding, and the Spirit was at work. The other thing, is this the same tongues here in Acts as the book of Corinthians in chapters 12 through 14 where Paul refers to that and where much of the focus is on today in the modern era? No, these are different. In Acts, they are all known languages. It's explicit. It's clear. It's the same word is used over and over and over again. But Paul, there is a difference in in the Corinthian church, and those are known as languages that were not known. They were not known by the speaker, and they were not known by the hearer. And they actually had to have an interpreter gifted by the Holy Spirit to make that clear. And what Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 14 is he says this about those tongues. He says, nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind, that means intelligible speech that I know is glorifying and honoring God, in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue that has to be interpreted and 
then understood by the hearer. And so these two are separated, and there's much thought. We have good Christian brothers and sisters on both sides of the aisle. And again, this is not a point of division as long as we center around that we need the Holy Spirit and that we're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit and all of us who are in Christ are baptized by the Holy Spirit. If we agree on those things, there is no reason for division and allow the Lord to build His church and work things out as He builds us into His bride of Christ. So another question. How do I know that I'm filled with the Spirit? If Ephesians 5, 18 says I need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, what does that look like? Give me some hints here. Well, we can go to Scripture for that. One is in Galatians 5, 22, where it shows what the gifts of the Spirit, what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Are those things lacking in my life? Oh, yeah. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? I need to be changed and transformed, and that's what the Spirit does. We also know that we are to be rooted in His love. Paul gives another uh, list there in Ephesians 3, beginning at 16, that we need to be drawn together and that the Holy Spirit is what shows us that the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts and gives us a love for each other, a love that the gospel would go out and that God is exalted in our lives. So we should all desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only is it an assurance of God's presence, but it's a process of ongoing sanctification where God is at work inside of us, changing my desires that I would not be serving myself, seeking my own kingdom, seeking my own self-exaltation, but that Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We need to be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit brings us wisdom and understanding of God's Word. The Spirit is called the Spirit of truth because He brings us God's truth. The Spirit empowers us and gives us boldness and courage to witness and actually do what Jesus has called us to do. And the Spirit brings us peace and hope. He's called our comforter. He's called our assurance. He's called our helper. So I just wanted to take a moment and stop and just hopefully scratch the surface on some of those questions because there's a lot out there. But I don't want you to be left in divisiveness or in confusion. There is one thing that we can all do, and that is for us to be praying that we would be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit, that God's presence would be in us changing us, transforming us, and that he would give us a heart to want to desire God's will in our life. That is something we can all center on and celebrate. As we go on, what is the God's purpose as the effect of the Spirit comes on Pentecost? It's revealed by the Holy Spirit exactly what God's purpose is. We see in verses 5 through 13 that a large crowd gathers, and we see in verse 12 that they all say, what does this mean? And what we're seeing here is the effect of the Holy Spirit on not only the apostles, the 120, but also on the whole crowd that gathers. The Holy Spirit is gathering them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know what brought them together. It was the sound of the mighty rushing wind. And explains there exactly who these men are. I'm sure there's women in the group too and kids. And they all come together. And who they are is Jews that have been born in foreign lands who were dispersed when Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria were overturned by both the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And all the Jews were exported and sent out all over the known empire at that time. So this list of 15 different countries or nations is not exhaustive. We know that there's Jews that were in far more regions than that, but it's a sampling all over the known world at that time that they had all come back to Jerusalem. They were now living and residing there, 
And when they hear the sound of a rushing wind, they come forward. Most likely the disciples have spilled out of this home, led and filled by the Holy Spirit. And they hear them speaking in their own language. And they are perplexed. They are amazed. And they are astonished. What is this? And we know that the that they were given these tongues in accordance with the Holy Spirit, for it says at the end of verse 4, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, these weren't educated guys. These were normal men, Galileans. In fact, they were backwoods hicks is how most of the empire considered them. They had a guttural language. They were even hard to understand. And he, here they are speaking fluent other foreign languages of up to 15 different nations. So this wasn't Hebrew, this isn't Greek, this isn't Latin. This is a known dialect from all these different regions. And it is amazing, not only to the disciples, but to the crowd, the effect. And what it's showing us is that God's purpose is being revealed. One it shows us that the power of God has come upon his disciples to actually allow them to do what he has called them to do, and that is to be his witnesses. So he's given them power, just like he promised. And also the Spirit has taken the first step in allowing them to be witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but already to the ends of the earth, because all these men are hearing it in their native tongue, and later 3,000 of them are saved, and most likely some of them go back to their prior regions and begin to build the church in their own locale. So the effect was amazing. And the Holy Spirit is what is drawing these men to the gospel. It was exactly as Jesus told them in John 16, when he was with his disciples just before Gethsemane, he says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, listen to what the job description is of the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And that's exactly what was happening. The Holy Spirit was already doing his work to convict the crowd. They were drawn together. They started hearing the mighty works of God declared in their own foreign language. And they said in verse 12, what does this mean? What in the world is going on? And what was going on is the Holy Spirit was drawing them. And we know the outcome of what happens as we peek ahead uh, into the end of Peter's sermon. As we get to Acts 2, verses 37 to 41, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So first, what does this mean? And now, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the effect of the Holy Spirit. And this reveals what God's purpose is for sending him, not only for us who are believers, who need his power in our life to change us and transform us, but to make traction with the world of the witness of Jesus Christ. So as the Holy Spirit comes and equips us and empowers us to speak the gospel and to do what we've been called to do and be obedient witnesses, the Holy Spirit at the same time is at work through the words that are spoken about the gospel, convicting the world and drawing them to Christ, that they are nothing like Christ that they are totally unrighteous, that their righteousness has failed them, that everything that they relied on is not righteous and it's revealed because only Jesus Christ, the righteous one, was risen from the grave and taken up into heaven. All the rest of us who are left who do not know Christ will know nothing but judgment at some future date. It's a sobering thought, but it's one that's full of grace because the whole point of the Holy Spirit 
is to convict so that he can heal, to convict so that he can transform, to bring an awareness of potential judgment because of our sins so that we would run to the Savior and say, oh, Jesus, rescue me, save me, I need you. So this morning, you might even be here and you might be thinking, I don't have that assurance of salvation. I've heard a lot about Jesus. I've heard a lot about the gospel. But I honestly can't say I have the power of the Spirit in my life. That's evident. Because I'm not able to change. I'm not a dog who can learn new tricks. My heart is still the same. It's not something that I can get away from. And I see that I'm a sinner. And the only way that I can be born again is to run to Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning, in a little while we're going to have a time as we take communion just to reflect. And even now in your seats, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be working in your heart. And if you have any questions about, am I saved? Do I know Christ? The words to us are the same words that Peter used. Repent in the name of Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness of sins. And the promise of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be saved. For others of us this morning, as we think about being filled with the Spirit, when we think of 1 Corinthians and we think in Ephesians, think of the fruit of the Spirit, and we think about love, joy, and peace, we think about the turmoil in our lives, we think about the frustration, the the anxiety that we carry, and the stress, and we think there is many parts still of my heart that I have not given over to Christ. There's many areas where I still block the working of the Holy Spirit. I would rather do my sin, my desires, my way, my will, my glory, rather than turning and running to God and asking for His will to be done in my life. All of us can pray this morning for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And what we're asking for when we ask for that is that God would come in and give us a desire to love him more, to serve him with all of our hearts, to be a different man or woman than we were last year, to grow with the knowledge of Christ. So I want you to be aware this morning as you leave and you ponder many thoughts, I'm sure, as we talk about the Holy Spirit this morning and as we move through the book of Acts The goal is to see the power of God still at work in your lives today. That the Holy Spirit is here today as he was 2,000 years ago. And he is the same God, the same Spirit, the same Lord. And he is grafting and building together his body of Christ so that we can continue to be faithful witnesses. The question is, do you want to be a faithful witness? Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be used of God? Do you want your life to count for Christ and not for yourself? If so, then you can pray with me this morning that we would be filled fresh with the Holy Spirit. So as we've seen, the Holy Spirit has come to fulfill God's plan. He has come to give the assurance of His very presence with us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We have the Spirit of Christ by the Holy Spirit in us. And we see by the Holy Spirit His, God's purpose being revealed as He moves out and He sends us out with the empowering gospel on our lips for a nation and a world around us, neighbors, siblings, parents, Loved ones who don't know yet Jesus Christ. Oh, let's bring the gospel to them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for your words. And we just pray, Lord, that you would spur us on to greater godliness. That we would seek you above all things. That we would desire to know you, Lord, more than anything else. So we ask now, Lord, that you would refill us. Bring us the wisdom of God, the truth of the Holy Spirit. 
Give us boldness in our witness. And help us, Lord, like never before, want your will to be done in our lives. So, Lord, as we come to this part in our service where we respond to you and take time to put our hearts and our minds before you, we ask, Lord God, that you would sift through our heart and our mind and that you would do a work in us where we bring up things and confess them to you and say, Lord, this is not right. This I've got wrong. Lord, I need your power and your strength to make me new. And Lord, I pray that you would meet us right there this morning, that you would comfort those that are hurt. Lord, that you would show your presence is mighty in them as they need your assurance. They are not alone. You are their helper, and you have given us the great gift of your Holy Spirit. We are so thankful. We are your children, and we are blessed beyond measure. In Jesus' name, amen.